أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعين به ونتوكل عليه والصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما كان لمؤمن ولا مؤمنة إذا قضى الله ورسوله أمرا أن يكون لهم الخيارة من أمرهم ومن يعص الله ورسوله فقد ضل ضلالا مبينا أمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم One of the interesting and widely practiced human behavior is the notion of choice in life in that we find that in our day-to-day -day existence there are many options that are available for us whether it's associated with lifestyle choices uh, to do with commodities or for example political choices the availability of options is there in many societies. Of course, there are, the more freedom that is practiced in a society, the more choices there are. So, for example, with regards to the freedom of expression, freedom of uh, determining one's uh, rule, for example, and so on and so forth. Options are plentiful in our day-to-day -day life. As much as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us free will that we are able to make a choice and we are presented with options, there is still a dimension within our existence, within our lives, which is associated with the fact that there must be complete unreserved obedience without the uh, tendency towards choosing whether to commit or to practice or not. And of course that is uh, with regards to the commands of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because as far as the generative will of God, which is related to uh, what happens in the cosmos, what happens to areas that we ha have any control over, that is not something that we have a choice. But with regards to the legislative will, meaning the salah, the fasting, the hajj, the khums, everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to do, in that respect, we do have a choice to do it or not, and he will not force us. But once we have become Muslims and have submitted, that is the point where we must do what is ordained upon us uh, by the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, one of the interesting uh, points is that Islamic law dictates that upon the acceptance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the creator, as the sovereign, absolute, perfect uh, being, who is the creator of everything and wants the best for us, upon acceptance of this and submission towards the faith, one must then follow the commands. The choice is then lifted as such. Yes, there is no compulsion. But within the Muslim Islamic setup, that is when the human being, the believer, is expected to obey and not to pick and choose. Why is this important? Because we have today the tendency whereby people say, it's my choice whether to practice or not. I want to do something and I wish to leave the other without necessarily following it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here in verse 36 of chapter 33, Surah Al-Ahzab, reminds believers that upon the acceptance of the religion of Islam, then it is not befitting, number one, and it should not be the case for believing men or women to somehow make a, a choice as far as the commands of God is concerned. And within the discussion of this, as we will come to in a few moments, is the story of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his progeny and his marriage to Zainab bint Jahsh, uh, who was married earlier to Zayd bin Haritha, who was his adopted son. So, and many times in the Quran, there are verses that are revealed for specific reasons, but are no doubt, as we know, they are applicable, and that's the style of the Quran. It uh, has a cause of revelation, but implications and teachings are for all 
to benefit throughout until the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, it is not right for mu'min and a mu'mina when Allah and his messenger decreed something that they have a choice over the matter simply because the spirit of Islam is taslim, total unreserved submission to the command and the will of God, the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a theme that is very much established in the Holy Quran. In chapter 4, verse 65, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, By God, they are not believers until they make you the arbiter between them when they have a dispute. ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتُ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا Then whatever you rule, they must follow and submit entirely. Meaning that when the Prophet of Islam says this person should be the one, for example, uh, given the ownership of a commodity that there's a dispute, then the people are not to choose whether to follow the Prophet or not. The Prophet has decreed and the Prophet's decree is, is absolutely conclusive and is final. So when Allah and his messenger say something, it is not for people to choose. They don't have a choice, so to speak. This don't have a choice doesn't mean physically. Yes, physically I can, abstain, I can not pray, for example. But that doesn't mean the physical abstinence of, a, of performing a particular action. It means in terms of the committing or in terms of the doing of an act, one should not say, well, you know what, I'm, I'm not keen on doing this. I want to do this and so on and so forth. The word qadha in, in this verse, إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ refers to what we know as al-qadha al-tashri'i means when Allah has ordained and has commanded something part of legislation, part of faith, part of sharia. When he has said do something, then the believers are expected to follow. Now the ulama say, does this sound a bit harsh? In essence, in today's world, unfortunately, many of these Quranic principles are sometimes viewed by people with suspicion in the West because of some of the ideas that they have developed and man-made laws, which uh, in, in, in some people's minds, you know, is accepted. However, people ask, but is this right to say that once you've become a Muslim, then you must follow and that there is no choice really for you? Well, it derives from the mercy of God. Why is that? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator and he knows what's best for us. It's like, for example, a parent when they're teaching their child and they're instructing their child to do something and the child doesn't like it. But the child says you have to do it. A parent says you have to do it. And eventually the child doesn't really have a say, so to speak. But the parent knows the benefit for the child despite the child's resistance, such as vaccinations, for example. The children are very much against anything which may hurt them, but the parents and the doctor know that it's indeed beneficial. And therefore, out of care and compassion for the child and for their well-being, they instruct and ensure that that actually does take place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as a creator, wants us to attain salvation, wants us to attain happiness and prosperity. If, for example, he had said, well, you know, here's the Qur'an, here's the message of the Prophet, you take from it whatever you want and leave whatever you want. If that choice was there, then human beings will not attain the righteous, virtuous position and will not strive to attain perfection, which brings them towards the becoming the recipients of paradise. That requires hardship, that requires obedience and indeed submission. So, the idea therefore is given at the end of the verse, وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا Anybody who disobeys God and his messenger has indeed gone astray. But this going astray is manifest going astray. It's very clear. ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا Meaning that you have recognized that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator, is the sovereign Lord. And of course, by being the creator, he knows exactly what we need and exactly how to get to our purpose in life. Once you know this, but yet to decide to go against God and his messenger, then that is very clear error. That is very clear misguidance, so to speak. 
Some of the Mufassirin interestingly have said the beginning of the verse when it says وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَ It refers to the idea of expression of something which is strange. You know, sometimes you say, I'm really surprised. I, I cannot fathom, I cannot imagine that somebody would do this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, it is not really for the believing men and women who have submitted to Allah to, and His Messenger to then come and say, you know what, we have a choice whether to follow God and His Messenger or not. It's not really for them. In other words, it's not part of their description because they're mu'min and mu'mina. That is what they're supposed to do. That is what they're commanded to do as believers. Now, the question that people say is, does this verse contradict the famous verse, La ikraha fiddin? There is no compulsion in religion. Because many times people come forward and say, well, you know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't force people to practice their faith, and you can't really force religion down people's throats, and if people don't want to accept a religion, then that's fine, all we have to do is preach. That is understandable and acceptable and correct as far as those who have not accepted Islam is concerned. So forceful conversion, what these terrorists do, is wrong, is anti-Islamic, and it is not part of the teachings of Sharia. Because you can force somebody and then they will start to pray because they're afraid of you, but their hearts have not submitted. And that's ultimately what matters to start off with. So your heart needs to have accepted the faith. You can't just practice because somebody has forced you. And that's why in Islamic law, any act which is forced is batil. Marriage, if somebody's forced someone to marry, is batil, meaning it's not a valid contract. If there's a buying and the selling of a product, uh, if you force someone to sell it, that transaction is void. That's why sometimes when we go to these countries where we haggle a lot, you know, some people really, you know, that's fine. They reduce the price quite considerably and you see the shopkeeper really unhappy. And they're like, what can I do? And, but it's important for us to say, are you happy for this to take place? Because if they feel like they've been actually forced and the actual transaction is void, despite the fact that you feel, wow, I've got a massive bargain. You know, I've managed to reduce the price more than half and so on. So often we say, look, are you satisfied? Are you, are you happy with this? You know, we don't want to uh, be unjust towards you. Now, this la ikraha fiddin, no compulsion religion, refers to being external, outside the religion. One should not be forcing anybody to accept. However, once an individual says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, and accepts the religion of Islam, and accepts the prophethood of the Holy Messenger, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny, that is when they must, and it is absolutely compulsory for them to perform the deeds and the actions, and they don't have a choice. It's very important distinction to make there. Now, the next um, verses talk about a very important story, which in my opinion is one of the most controversial in the Holy Quran, related to the Holy Prophet, peace and, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny. One that has been the subject of much discussion and attack on the personality of the Holy Prophet and questioning of his asma. And unfortunately, due to the existence of some narrations, it has uh, been utilized by the Islamophobes and those anti-Muslim uh, uh, propagators, so to speak. And it's the story concerning three individuals. So these only three people are part of the story. The Prophet, Zainab bin Tajahsh, and Zayd ibn Haritha. Now, first of all, Zayd ibn Haritha, was a man who was a young boy who was stolen from his family and then sold as a slave in Arabia. Um, a man by the name of Hakim ibn Huzam bought him and gifted him to Sayyida Khadija, salamullahi alayha. Later, Sayyida Khadija gifted him, of course, as a servant or a slave, to the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and his holy progeny. And the Prophet of Islam looked after him and he became very much uh, loyal to the Holy Prophet. Um, one day in Medina, we are told, in the marketplace, some people recognized Zayd. 
and they said, we know you, you're from this family and so on. And they informed his father who was um, elsewhere. And he, the father requested that his son is returned back to him. Yes. Now, the Prophet of Islam came and was told this. He gave Zayd a choice. He said, you're free. You can go back to your father or you can stay with me. It's entirely up to you. Zayd said, how can I choose anyone over the Messenger of Allah? So he opted to stay with the Holy Prophet. And the Prophet of Islam freed him and adopted him as his son. And people used to be calling him uh, Zayd ibn Muhammad. But then if you remember the beginning of Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would say that, you know, your real sons are your biological sons, not the ones that you adopt. And therefore, people then returned back to calling him Zayd ibn Haritha. Now, the distinguishing features of Zayd that no other person has is that he's the only companion mentioned by name in the Quran. There is no other companion of the Holy Prophet that is mentioned by name except Zayd. And the verse is this, verse 37 of Surah Al-Ahzab, chapter 33. Um, he later led an army against the Roman Byzantines in the Battle of Mu'ta in the year 8 after Hijra with Ja'far al-Tayyar and both were martyred. So Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the brother of Amir al-Mu'mineen, was martyred with Zayd ibn Haritha. His son Usama ibn Zayd was chosen by the Prophet to lead the army when the Prophet was about to leave this world. And he was young and he was objected by some of the Sahaba. Anyway, just to piece the puzzle sometimes historically is needed. Now Zainab, who is Zainab? Zainab was daughter of a man by the name of Umayyah ibn Abdul Muttalib. Hence she is the, the cousin of the Prophet. Okay? And of course belonged to a very established aristocratic, so to speak, family. Now at that time, the practice was that a slave cannot marry somebody well, from a well-known family. It was totally unacceptable in the urf or in the culture. And the Prophet of Islam wanted to break that in the idea that marriages should be for uh, the, in terms of quality of the human beings and their righteousness rather than their family background and their wealth. So what happened was that he sent a message to Zainab through somebody that I want to arrange for your marriage. That was the kind of message. Zainab, when she got this message, she thought the Prophet is, gain, is proposing to her. So she was very happy. She was delighted. And then, of course, the Prophet said to her that this is not for himself, but for his adopted son, Zayd ibn Haritha. Zainab bin Tijah objected. She said, you know, how can I marry someone like him? Her brother Abdullah also objected. So both of them said, that's not going to be possible. We can't accept this. This verse was revealed, verse 36. That when Allah and his messenger decree something, you should not object. You should not say, you know, I don't want to. You should follow the command of Allah and his messenger. And the messenger, you know, when the Prophet of Islam had, says anything, it is not his personal choice, so to speak. It is a decree, it's a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when the Prophet of Islam wanted to marry Zainab and Zayd, it was for a reason. And many a times this actually is for the well-being of others and for uh, legislating law as well and breaking certain cultural tendencies that used to exist. When the verse was revealed, Zainab said fine. Her brother also said fine. If this is what God and his messenger want, then so be it. And therefore, they both got married. This verse 37, though, then goes on to describe what happened in the marriage. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ تَقُولُوا لِلَّذِي أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَأَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْسِكْ عَلَيْكَ زَوْجَكِ you say to the one whom Allah has blessed, blessed and you have blessed, retain your wife. Or in other words, keep patient, keep at it, persevere. Now, first thing is, who is the one whom Allah has blessed and you have blessed? 
So it has they have been recipients of two t- different blessings, so to speak, if we talk about it in that way. It's Zayd. How has Allah blessed him? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed him by guiding him towards the faith. Yes. And towards the Messenger of Allah. And the Prophet, how has he blessed him? And whom you too have blessed. How has he blessed him? Well, he has freed him and treated him as his son. So that's a great blessing. So he has somehow double blessing. Now, Allah says, you said to that, and subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say you say to Zayd or you say to that person. He says, just remind him, look, we, you, have, you have been, you know, given two different blessings, yes, from the Almighty, one and the other from the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny. Now, what is this about? Why was the Prophet saying to Zayd, be patient, hold on to your wife? According to the Nirwayat, the marriage didn't go very well. Zainab and Zayd simply were not getting along that well. It doesn't mean that it was doomed from the beginning. If they had put the effort, both of them, it may have worked. Yes. Um, especially the fact that the Prophet of Islam would not have said, let both of, them, both of them marry each other, knowing that it will end in divorce. No, that's not possible. Every action of the Prophet is truth. It cannot be any mistake or anything as far as the Prophet of Islam is concerned. Therefore, what happened? Well, you know, obviously Zainab was from a much richer family. Zaid was much poorer. There was that, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, the lack of compatibility and the lack of flexibility in dealing with this as well was very much um, uh, apparent. And so Zayd would come and complain to the Prophet and say, Ya Rasulullah, I, I'm not getting along. Some narrations say Zainab is mistreating me. And the Prophet would say, Pay, be patient. Hold on to your wife. Hold on to your wife. Amsik alayka zawjak. Don't divorce. And he wanted divorce and the Prophet would constantly say, wait and wait and wait. The next part though of the verse is the one that is the, one of the most so-called problematic and requires your attention, slightly technical here, because it's been used by the enemies of Islam to attack the Prophet. The verse says, وَتُخْفِي فِي نَفْسِكَ مَا اللَّهُ مُبْدِيهِ وَتَخْشَ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ أَحَقُّ أَنْ تَخْشَاهِ It is somehow rebuking the Prophet. It's saying, and you've, you had hidden in your heart what Allah was to divulge, divulge, and you feared the people. Allah should have been worthier for you to fear Him. So when Allah says to the Messenger, you feared the people, why didn't you fear God? So to speak, that has been picked on by a lot of people. They say, Allah is rebuking the messenger, saying somehow you are fearing people. Now, what does this all mean? How was the Prophet fearing people, so to speak, and how has it been understood in this way? I'll give you an opinion of certain mufassireen, and uh, also it's very interesting to see a shift in the uh, in the understanding of this verse as uh, throughout history too. So for example, uh, Allama Tabari, who is a very well-known uh, Sunni uh, Mufassir, exegetes, he said, he says basically, or he narrates these uh, we call Israelite traditions. What are these Israelite traditions? Basically false traditions, which unfortunately also have found them w- their, their way towards uh, books uh, of Orientalists and others. He says, once the Prophet of Islam went to see Zayd, he knocked on the door, and there's some different narrations. Same, some say there wasn't a door, it was a curtain, and the wind blew the curtain, and he saw Zainab without hijab. And he saw her in her with her you know, uh, normal garments, uh, and he was infatuated by her, according to this narration. And then he would say, Subhanallah Khaliq Nur, Tabarakallahu Ahsanul Khaliqeen. He would say, Glory be to Allah, the creator of light. And would praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this vision of Zainab cast admiration into the heart of the Prophet, according to this narration of Tabari, yes, which we do not accept. And later, that means when Zayd heard this, he said, That's it. I have to. 
get married, uh, divorced, and you marry her. I don't want to be married to her anymore because you have this liking of Zainab. And Allah is telling, rebuking him because Allah is saying to him, you have hidden in your heart what you should have said to people, and that is you have this admiration of Zainab. Yes, and you hidden it. And you feared what people might say, how can you, know, you have a liking of her? But you should fear God. So negative, negative attack on the Prophet's personality and practice. Sadly, it's there in the tafsir, and a few other fasirin have also included these narrations too. How do we re respond to this? Well, uh, we completely reject it on the principle, on the, on the following points. Some of, I mean, some of these points can be discussed. Number one, Zainab bin Tajahsh was the Prophet's cousin. He had seen her many times. If, you know, it's not about seeing her from the door. Yes, of course, he'd seen her with hijab and so on. But it is not about the Prophet being infatuated or anything like that. Yes. Number two, the Prophet kept telling Zaid, be patient, be patient. And if, and you shouldn't divorce, if he had this particular likening of her, why did he keep telling Zaid to be patient? Have just said, yeah, fine, divorce, and he would have then married her. And thirdly, very importantly, of course, the Quran is categorical and emphatic on the asma of the Prophet, error free, sinless nature of the Prophet. He does not speak from himself. Therefore, and amongst many other verses, which highlight that the actions and the words of the Prophet are pristine. And therefore, to say or to insinuate or to suggest that the Prophet would fall in love somehow or be infatuated by a non-mahram would be against the principle of so-called infallibility or error-free, sinless nature of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny. Now, other mufassirin have come forward, like Al-Qurtubi, who is also a famous Sunni mufassir. He said, you know, the reason why Allah is telling him you have feared people and you should have feared Allah and you've kept something in your heart. What was it that he kept in his heart? The Prophet earlier was told by God that one day you're going to marry Zainab. You, he knew that he is going to marry Zainab and yet he kept telling Zaid, be patient, be patient, be patient. But Allah had given him prior knowledge that one day he is going to be Zainab's husband, Zainab bin Tijah's husband. Um, and therefore, he kept this from, and did not divulge it to the people that one day he's going to marry Zainab bin Tijash. And Allah says, you should have feared me and not the people. Fakhruddin al-Razi, who is arguably one of the biggest and most important uh, mufassireen of our brothers, the Ahlul Sunnah, he comes down very hard against all the suggestions, thankfully, alhamdulillah. But still, at the end, you'll see the difference in our, uh, some of our ulama, the way they viewed this particular incident this highly controversial incident. Fakhruddin al-Razi, what did he say? He says, action of the Prophet, whatever he did was not a sin because Allah would have said to him, seek repentance. So he says, he, re he rejects all these narrations about the Prophet seeing Zainab, you know, without hijab and all that and being infatuated. He says, that's nonsense because if it was the case, the Pro Allah would have said something and said, look, you should seek repentance because it would be a sin, yes? So it is not a sin, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not ask him for repentance. Secondly, as we will see, Islamic law was established later of the marriage of the Prophet with Zainab, and therefore the actions of the Prophet were fine, because they were leading to an act, uh, in, uh, a legislation to be established in Sharia law. Okay? And thirdly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the marriage, as you will see, we wedded her to you. You know, if you see part, uh, if you read down of the same verse, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then I married her to you. So how can this command from Allah, which, you know, resulted in the marriage of Zainab with the Prophet, be something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebukes at the beginning, it says it's wrong and so on and so forth. He actually accepts it and says, I am the one who caused this to happen. And then he, he, he's left with this dilemma though. Then why did Allah rebuke the Prophet? If it's all good, if it's all positive, why did he rebuke him? He says, well, you know, the Prophet feared Allah and the people. He shouldn't have feared both. He should have feared Allah only. So that's the only criticism he would say, that Allah rebuked him and says, why did you fear the people? What people would say, you know? Just fear Allah. 
don't have any fear or apprehension from the humankind. Now, let's have a look at the Shia theologians. Shia Mufassirin, Shia ulama have looked at this very interestingly, slightly different to this. For example, Sayyid al-Murtada, uh, who is a very well-known jurist as well as a theologian, he uh, has a book called Tanzihul Anbiya, Exonerating Prophets. And he discusses this story. He says, you know, it is what is known as tarka awla, that leaving that which is desirable. So it's not a sin, and he rejects all the other narrations that point to any lustful intention behind the marriage of the Prophet with Zainab. But he says, you know, the Prophet should have not um, feared the people, you know, but that's not a sin. It's uh, tarka awla, leaving that which is desirable. Many of our current ulama and theologians don't accept the idea that the Prophet or the Imams or the Ahl al-Bayt, the 14 Ma'asumin, ever practiced tarq awla. Even that, you know, is, is not uh, part of their uh, conduct because of the purity and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thoroughly cleansed them. Yutahhirakum tathira. Therefore, that is what is um, presented. Now, Allama Taba Taba'i has given arguably, perhaps, amongst the, one of the best answers. And this is, and I would like to ask you to focus on this because the reason why he's gone to this extent is the effort of the uh, Shia Ithna Ashari scholars to ensure that the, mess, that the depiction of the Prophet is indeed pristine and that they do not leave any chance for people to attack the Prophet. And it is well within the Quranic theme. So they did not necessarily make things up, God forbid, to try and defend the Prophet. No. But it's, you know, when you have a principle, the principle is that the Prophet is ma'asum. The Prophet is the best of God's creation. Okay? Now, you take that and you look at these verses. You look at it with that lens. You don't look at it with the lens of the narrations because unfortunately some of our brothers from the other schools, they say, well, you know, we have narrations, so what are we going to do with them? If we're going to say the Prophet did not make any mistake or he was not really rebuked, so how are we going to explain the narrations? The school of al Bayt says, forget the narrations. That's not important. If the narrations subject the Prophet or the Imams or the Ahl al-Bayt in a negative light, we don't accept it. The spirit of the Quran we have to take, and that is to completely exonerate the Prophet and to keep emphasizing their position and their status, which is high in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First of all, Allama rejects all the narrations that talk about the lustful intention, similar with many other mufassirin too. He, though, says, says here, he says that the fear of the Prophet was for the sake of Allah. Okay? So when Allah says, وَتَخْشَ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ أَحَقُّ أَن تَخْشَى You were fearing uh, the people. He, was the, he says the Prophet of Islam was fearful of the reaction of the people when they hear that he was going to marry Zainab because at that time it was wrong or not allowed for the, somebody to marry the ex of his son, uh, adopted son. So if you have an adopted son, they've got a wife. If they've divorced, it was not acceptable for the father who's, who's got an adopted son to marry the ex-wife of his adopted son, who's wrong in that and of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through this particular process, completely abolished that and established that it's okay. Now, the Prophet of Islam, for the sake of Allah, had that fear that people would start talking. Now, well, not, not start talking to criticize him. It wasn't about him. He had the fear that they would start to maybe go slightly back from the obedience of God. So it's all about you know, how much Allah has perceived or how close people become to faith. That's what he says. So his fear was entirely for the sake of Allah, not for himself. It wasn't that he was fearful of criticism that would be directed to himself, but rather it was uh, more of the bigger picture. But what about the criticism? Again, so this is where Fakhruddin Razi couldn't answer, but Allama comes up with a good, fairly nice response to this. He says, but look, Allah is telling him, why did you fear people? You should have feared me. So it's a rebuke, apparently as a rebuke. He says, this is the style of the Quran when Allah speaks with his messenger, 
because of the fact that he is the closest to Allah from all human beings, yes, the style is such that it may be perceived by people as criticism, but in reality, it demonstrates the proximity and the compassion of God with his messenger. Sometimes you and I, when we speak to people who are very close, if others see us, they say, how can you speak to them one like that? They say, don't worry, I'm very close with that person, you know? And others might say, but if you say it to someone else, they'll take offense. Say, so I know, because this person is very close to me. So when I say it to them, it's not a problem. That's why the famous narration says of the Holy Prophet, Adabani Rabbi fa'ahsana ta'dibi. The one who trained me and taught me etiquettes and adab was my Lord, and he perfected it. It's Allah who trained me. Yes, and another narration says, Ana Adibullah. I am the one who has been trained by Allah. Wa Aliyun Adibi. And Ali is the one I trained. Yes? Now, there are many similar verses in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, in chapter 66, would say, Ya ayyuhan nabi, lima tuharrim ma ahallallahu lak. O Prophet, why are you making haram what Allah has made halal for you? Tabtaghi marvat azwajik. You are looking to please your wives? Now, again, that has caused a bit of controversy because people come and say, ah, but why is Allah speaking to the Prophet that way? It is not that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is somehow rebuking the Prophet, it demonstrates the proximity and the special relationship that is exhibited and displayed. And therefore you would notice that in the attempt, as we see uh, the current trend in the school of Ahl al-Bayt is to ensure that any verse in the Quran is viewed with the light of the defense of the Holy Prophet, his personality, his conduct, and so on and so forth, and not in any shape or form uh, anything which may allow others to attack him and so on. Now, going back to the verse, and more can be said, by the way, but uh, uh, you know, it, it suffices for, for the time being. Um, going back to the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِّنْهَا وَطَرًا زَوَّجْنَاكَهَا لِكَيْ لَا يَكُونَ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ حَرَجٌ فِي أَزْوَاجِ أَدْعَيَائِهِمْ When uh, Zayd finished, meaning he divorced her, we married her to you. After the Idda, the period of time which should be observed. And um, the reason for that is to legislate law so that believers from that time till the day of judgment will not be in any shape or form blamed or it, no one will can say it's wrong to marry the wives of their adopted sons. Okay. The first thing is that watar in Arabic فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِنْهَا وَطَرًا Watar means uh, something which is important you know, not a trivial matter, something critical. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using a different word for talaq here. So when Zayd made that very important decision, not small to terminate the marital contract, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Zawwajna kaha, we are the one who married her to you. Now, interestingly, Zainab, in Tajash, used to boast to other wives of the Prophet about this. She used to say, Zawwajakunna ahlakunna, your families ma married you. Wazawwajani Allahu min as sama, but Allah married me to the Prophet. You know, your families accepted whatever the Prophet proposed, but it for me is different. And uh, that, was, uh, that is established or that is narrated in history. And of course, the idea is to legislate law to make it okay for this particular relationship to happen. وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ مَفْعُولًا Allah's command has to be fulfilled, will definitely fulfill. Um, there is uh, no doubt when there is the decree of God that will happen. Okay, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, nobody can be in any state of hesitation. Again, this is for the well-being and for the wellness of the society in large. Now, verse 38 says, مَا كَانَ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ مِنْ حَرَجٍ فِي مَا فَرَضَ اللَّهُ لَهُ There is, it's not the Prophet who should be blamed because you know after this, when the Prophet of Islam married Zainab bin Tajash, the criticism started. 
people started talking. Oh, how can he? Why is he? This is not acceptable. In which way is he doing this? Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, hold on. Don't blame the Prophet. This is what Allah has commanded. It is not something that you should be blaming individuals for. Um, and this reminds me as well about some of, I know it's a totally different thing and I'm not comparing the two, but sometimes some of our mu'mineen, they get a bit too carried away when it comes to criticism of maraja. They come and say, why is this marja got this ruling on the deferring of horizons? Why? Well, the marja isn't doing it because he enjoys having a different opinion or wants to stick to it because of a particular reason. That's his conviction of what the, the Islamic texts are pointing towards. And he'll be accountable for it on the Day of Judgment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you are blaming the Prophet, but don't, that's wrong. It's Allah who's given that command, yes? So similarly, when it comes to rulings of the maraja, it's their understanding of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has presented. Yes, they could be right, they could be mistaken. And it's not, you know, it's not for anybody to come and say, unless they're jurists themselves, and then they would have an etiquette of debating and discussing with a marja. But for what is surprising is some of our brothers and sisters coming and say, I don't agree with this marja. La ilaha illallah. You don't agree, but how can you say I don't agree with a marja, whereas the element of agreement needs substantial knowledge and the know-how of deducting law in Islam. So it is not for me and you, anybody to come and say I don't agree with this marja. If you have evidence and it is, for example, part of your field, which is sometimes the case. For example, you know, there's the massive discussion in uh, Islamic uh, bioethics today about what constitutes death. Is it brain death or when the organs fail, when the heart stops, for example? Yeah? So I've been in discussion with many doctors who say, you know what, you know, brain death is it. And so a lot of Amarajah say no. It's, you know, doesn't mean uh, that, uh, unless the whole organs fail or complete shutdown that happens. And so there's all these discussions, you know, that's fine. A per person in their profession can go to the marja and discuss. Yes, and say, look, this is the evidence, this is the evidence, no problem. But it's when, unfortunately, sometimes we lose that element of respect for somebody who's out there trying to serve the community and not necessarily personal gains at all. That's something we have to remember. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فِيمَا فَرَضَ اللَّهُ له. It is, a, Allah has made it incumbent, فَرْض. It is a decree from the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is important because, you know, in chapter 49, verse 7, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and very quickly I'll mention the translation, says, um, if the Prophet was to obey you in many matters, you would suffer. So you don't know what is best for you. So, you know, when people were criticizing, you know, if the Prophet was to listen to you and say, yeah, you know what, you're right, it would not be good for you. You've got to believe in God and submit to what he wants. Ultimately, that is what will give you what is benef beneficial. And it's a characteristic, therefore, of the Prophets and people who are in a position of leadership and a position to guide individuals, not necessarily to listen to the people as far as these detrimental decisions related to Islamic law is concerned. So just because there is a popular uh, dislike of a ruling doesn't mean the marja should change the ruling. They will only change the ruling if they are convinced from the source that that is, and other factors which are related to the extrapolation of the law. But doesn't mean if the vast majority of people say, we don't like this, because they don't know what is good for them and what is bad for them. It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows that. Um, and the Prophet is then reminded that this kind of thing where people will not understand and they object is something that happened in the past. Sunnatullahi fil ladheena khalaw min qabl. It is something that has happened with those who have come in the previous times. In other words, all the Prophets, they came, they were not necessarily popular. You know, in the sense that popular in the sense sometimes they challenge status quo, they challenge the cultural practices of the people. 
And therefore, people would criticize them. People would not necessarily accept them. Allah says, this is how some things happen. And it is not the first time with the Holy Prophet. وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ قَدَرًا مَقْدُورًا it is the will of God, it is the command. But here, the difference here, Qadar and Maqdura, and the previous verse is what? Wakana Amrullahi Maf'ula. Here, Qadar and Maqdura. Qadar and Maqdura, that one says it's going to happen. This one says it is something that God has already ordained, part of his Qadar. This is the command of Allah. In other words, the legislation was to happen whether people like it or not. That's part of the Qadr. Yes. It could be understood that maybe the previous verse related to the fact that the Prophet will fulfill what Allah has done. وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ مَفْعُولًا فِعِل comes from the act. Here it comes from the Qadr that Allah has decreed. Therefore, the decree will definitely uh, actually take place. What's interesting is that um, uh, Shaykh Al-Tabarsi narrates that when this verse was revealed and you know the Prophet of Islam married Zainab, he held a massive feast in Medina. One that he never held for any other wife. And uh, people came, they ate. Why? It's not because of the priority or superiority of Zainab at all. It was to say that the Prophet was not worried about criticism of the people. This is God's command and therefore I will celebrate it, yes? I will spread it, I will establish it, and I want the whole of Arabia to know about it. So it's not something I'm gonna keep quiet. It's easy for you and I to say now, but imagine today if there's something which is widely accepted and very much frowned upon, and all of a sudden it's changed. People are shocked, you know, oh, this is not how we often do this. This is not right, you know, it will take quite a considerable amount of time, depending on the personality of the individual, whether they have the jurisdiction to do this or not, for people to follow in that manner. The final verse in our discussion is a very powerful verse and a reminder to anyone out there who takes part in tabligh and spreading the message of Islam and delivering uh, guidance. الَّذِينَ يُبَلِّغُونَ رِسَالَاتِ اللَّهِ وَيَخْشَوْنَهُ وَلَا يَخْشَوْنَ أَحَدًا إِلَّا اللَّهِ Allah says, if you are involved in the tabligh, tabligh comes from iblag in Arabic. Iblag refers to delivering something. Yes. Allah says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you are part of this tabligh process, you are delivering risalat Allah, the messages of God. Yes? That, of course, was revealed to the prophets and it's passed on throughout time. And these risalat Allah, you deliver them in all different ways. So, for example, through speech, through writing, through advising, through answering questions. These are all involved in the part of tabligh, and we know this. In the process of tabligh, has many different tools and many different ways. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here sets the constitution, very critical to understand, for anyone involved in tabligh. Yes, which is what? What is absolutely needed to be kept in mind. And that is, وَيَخْشَوْنَهُ وَلَا يَخْشَوْنَ أَحَدًا إِلَّا اللَّهِ They only have khashya of Allah, they don't have fear of other human beings in what they deliver, in what they say. Meaning that they will only say that which pleases Allah because they have khashya of Allah, will come to understanding of what that means. But if that makes people unhappy, they're not worried because they don't fear human beings. This is important. Now, just before we discuss this a bit further, let's just focus on the word khashya. In Arabic, khashya and khawf are synonymous. In many lexographers, when they discuss khashya and khawf, they say it's the same thing, yes. In, when we look at it in a deeper sense, and also in mystical works, in Islamic spirituality, there is an interesting discussion with regards to the status of a person who displays khashya. 
And that is, they say khashya is al khawf al muqtarin bil ta'zimi wal ihtiram. It is fear which is coupled, infused with awe and respect. That's the difference. Okay. A very simple example, and again, when we give examples, they're figurative, meaning we don't comparing. I must say this because it's not about comparing, but sometimes when you are in a presence of a very well-known alim or marja, you don't even do things which are makruh, let alone haram, because you have so much respect for the individual, and also there is that awe, you're, you're kind of taken back by that person, yes? That khashiyah, is what we're talking about. And when the word in, in the Quran is used in reference to the expression of that form of all consciousness, so to speak, if we were to translate it, of Allah, it refers differently. So here it's used in reference to Allah and human beings. For the human beings, it's contextual, isn't it? So you look at every word and in which, who, whom is it describing? If it's khashya of Allah, then we talk about, we understanding as that respect and that awe and that fear which is infused with knowing the, the, the being whom we are fearful. If it's used to describe human beings, then it's fear. As fear that people um, exhibit and display. Okay. An interesting part is in Dua Ikumail when Amir al Mu'minin, peace and blessings be upon him, says, Habli sabartu ala harrinarik, fa kayfa asbiru anin nadari ila karamatik, am kayfa askunu fin nar wal jay afwak. This is khashya. Amir al Mu'minin in Dua Ikumail says, If I'm able to uh, be patient in enduring your chastisement in hell, I cannot ever fathom being away from you. Cannot ever imagine being distant from you. That is the degree of respect and awe that is viewed in the high, uh, eyes of a salihin and, and awliya, the true friends of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran interestingly says, ulama. The more knowledge you have, the higher khashya you have. Knowledge, of course, not all knowledge, yes. Knowledge which gets you closer to Allah. So it is somehow related to the degree of cognizance and understanding. The idea here is, the message from the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala is that invariably in the process of tabligh, there are different methods. There are ways in which an individual comes to make people hear what they love to hear only and there are those who would come and speak things which people dislike but it's the truth but it's needed okay and there's no doubt that this is applicable at all times including in our modern time meaning today we have some cultural practices we're not against culture at all culture has a good position in our lives there's no problem but when culture as we all know sometimes <coughs> conflicts with religion, we are in a difficult position in the sense that sometimes when people speak out immediately they're shot down or immediately they are not respected. Oh, he's challenging this, but we've done it for thousands of years. SubhanAllah, the Quran also says when the prophets came to individuals who were worshipping idols, we're telling them, why are you worshipping idols? And we'd give them rational discourse. They would say, well, our forefathers did it, so we do it as well. It's constant theme in the Qur'an of people using this excuse that, well, you know, the people in the past did it, so we'll do it too. Okay. So, you know, it is, you know, it is important to recognize, and, and I remember here the very beautiful sermon of Imam Zain al-Abidin salam, in which he stood in the courtyard of Yazid, and you know what he said? He said to Yazid, let me speak, because I want to say that which pleases Allah and benefits human beings. These are two things. I'm not going to say that which makes everyone think, wow, what an amazing speech, well done, because that's what I've heard for 50 years. If it is something which is part of the teachings of the religion, we must be able to challenge it if people are not following it. A simple example, I get many emails from sisters complaining about the Sayyid non-Sayyid issue in marriage. And I have spoken about it, and I know it's a very sensitive topic in certain communities. 
And people really hate it when it's brought up, but it's a big challenge out there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't worry about what people say. If you're there for the sake of Allah, and you're doing this tabliq of the message of Allah, then that's what matters at the end of the day. It's not about how many likes you have on Facebook. It's not about how many followers. It's not about that. Yes, sometimes we have to be also careful on the way we present the message. We don't want to alienate people. There's no doubt. And this is an art. This is not reference to this. Because remember, the Quran also says to Musa, when you go to Fir'aun, فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنَا Speak softly with him. But then say, go to Fir'aun and say, you are amazing, you're good, don't talk to him about God. Because he's not going to like it. No, the style is different, but the message is the same. You speak softly, so that what? It may penetrate his heart. But you tell him about Tawheed and the oneness of God. So, when it comes to uh, certain practices that we have, which we are seeing in this day and age, God forbid, that are being practiced by some of our brothers and sisters, and we have spoken in the past about some habits, sadly, that is happening with regards to hijab, for example, there needs to be a discussion about this in a calm manner, not condescend condescending and not necessarily uh, condemning people towards, oh, this person's going to hell, or this person, no. But the message must be given, given in an appropriate manner, but must not be somehow shelved for, you know, for the sake of the fact that some people may not like it and they may feel offended by it. As long as it's part of Sharia and it is the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt which is Sharia, then there is what a need for it to be presented in its uh, manner, in its correct manner. But of course, this final point, this doesn't apply to instances where we have to practice taqiyya due to the fear of what might happen to an individual as far as their life or their uh, survival is concerned. Those are very um, specific instances, yes, just to kind of um, mention this. But by and large, the lens that the muballigh should be wearing when giving the message like I said, not only lectures, not only sermons, writing, when it comes to discussions, when it comes to teaching in madrasa, everything, this is all part of tabliq, should be, is it pleasing Allah or not? Am I only doing it for the fear of Allah or am I fearful of human beings? And that is an important barometer for the success of the individual as a muballigh spreading the message of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين